All righty. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. I am just going to be setting up this uh, Facebook um, live here. And we will get officially started. And I will admit these more people here. So thank you all for joining us. Um, for those of you who have um, joined us that might have heard it either on Facebook or some of the other press releases or perhaps through Tracy, um, I'm Maggie Stripmotter and I am the adult programming and outreach librarian here at the McIntosh Memorial Library, which is in Viroqua. Um, we are absolutely honored and thrilled to have Tracy here to talk with us, um, honestly, just to talk with us, but to talk about the topic, um, modern, Ho-Chunk modern history, um, the 1800s, you know, till now. Sorry, I'm still admitting people. Um, so really appreciate you all, all you being here. Um, like I said, if you want to keep muted and you can always do um, questions through the chat, um, or if you wanted to, you know, like raise a little hand um, when there are time for questions, and there is time for questions. So Tracy, I will hand it over to you. Thank you again. And yes, there you go. Hi, P. Hi, Chara. Hi, P. Hi, John. Kisha na hini kanagiwi. Aho chang krajra choni naji winga hingai dena. Michael Raja, Tracy, Little Janga, Hingaidena, Ho Chankra Egi, Hunchi Kikach Hija, Wawa Jena. Good morning. It's good to see all of you. I welcome you. I am Tony uh, Najiwi, is my Ho Chunk name. Uh, Tracy Little John is my, uh, well, I call it my legal name, my white name, my colonizer name, whichever one you think is appropriate. And I am Ho-Chunk, and I am also a member of the Bear Clan of the Ho-Chunk Nation. I am, I live in La Crosse. I was born on French Island. Um, don't plan on going anywhere. I lived in Minnesota and Texas as a child, but um, my home is here. And you might get a sense of why I don't wanna leave as I talk through you um, things today. I'm going to be talking about a few different things, but primarily it's focusing on the 1800s and 1900s and a lot of the things that have happened to my people during that, those two centuries um, and then what it looks like for today. Um, so I want to start off with just our original homelands. Uh, the Menominee and the Ho-Chunk are actually the original tribes of what is now Wisconsin. Uh, there are also some of the um, Lakota, Dakota, Dakota people that were um, somewhat in the area, but it was primarily the two tribes uh, before uh, the Ojibwe showed up. They were actually further east and they had a prophecy that told them to um, go towards the sun until they found the food that grows on water and um, they got to northern Minnesota, northern Wisconsin, um, across the border into what's Canada, um, and they found the wild rice growing on the water. So they stopped. And then we also um, were joined by the Potawatomi, the Oneida, the Brotherton, the Mohican, um, due to the um, encroachment by the settlers from the east. Um, let me just say, I'm seeing people on here that I know, and I, that's so cool that they want to come and hear me talk. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I will leave time at the end um, for questions. And um, you know, I got all distracted. I am a very informal speaker, so. <laughs> Um, but anyways, all right. So we were in Wisconsin, and uh, we saw in uh, we saw a lot of the encroachment. A lot of tribes were moving further west. Um, and then 1830, uh, Andrew Jackson had the Indian Removal Act, and that is when 
that was stated that all tribes needed to move west of the Mississippi River. We had a lot of treaties with the United States as did every tribe. Uh, every single one of them has been broken, um, but they're still the law of the land. So um, they are still abided by partially, <laughs> let's say. Um, I am gonna actually share, this is probably the only time I'm gonna share my screen, um, but let's see, where is that one? Um, I wanted to share this one just so that you could get a little bit more of a visual. Um, I have a list of the treaties here. Um, some of them were just in the beginning establishing the, the, the boundaries. Um, and then um, you can see in 1829, um, we ceded over 2 million acres. And then with the Treaty of 1832, um, we lost some more land. Um, and then 1837 is when we actually had to move. And what happened is that within the nation, my, my clan, the, um, the Bear Clan, we are the ones who actually have the say-so on what happens with land. And for the 1837 treaty, they had brought some of our men to the negotiations and um, they often with treaties, they would, um, basically just force signatures. Um, sometimes it would be they would get people drunk until they would sign it. They would tell you tell them, we're not paying for you to get back on a train and get back home until you've signed it. Um, and that happened a couple of times um, with ours. Uh, and then with the 1837, um, what was negotiated and what was translated was that there would be eight years to get all of the Ho-Chunk to move west of the Mississippi River. There were no Bear Clan members there. And when they found out it wasn't actually eight years, the translator lied and it was eight months, a lot of Ho-Chunk people were very upset, but unfortunately um, the United States enforced um, this false agreement. And so we got moved over to Iowa and this is our first reservation. Um, basically, if you can see where my cursor is. Can you see my cursor? Okay, I wasn't sure. Um, basically coming up straight across from where I am now um, in Richmond, Minnesota, this was the first reservation, uh, Turkey River or the neutral ground. And we had the Lakota directly to our north and we had the sock directly to our south and they were warring and we got stuck in the middle and we did have some casualties because of that. Um, so then in 1846, we were like, yeah, we're sick of this. Um, let's go somewhere else. Well, then they sent us all the way up into Minnesota to Long Prairie. Uh, Long Prairie was a little bit different as far as um, the climate, um, the, the vegetation. So it wasn't quite what we were used to. Uh, at one point, we did try and negotiate another treaty where the Dakota had offered some, some land, um, and it would be closer to like Minneapolis area, and it was the Watab Treaty, which didn't go through, it was not approved. Um, but they were still insistent, we need someplace that's more like home. So then in 1855, we went down to Blue Earth, which is Mankato, basically. And we were doing pretty good. Um, people were liking it. It's a lot more like uh, Wisconsin. Uh, things were getting established. At one point, uh, the, the Ho-Chunk people that were there actually sold off half of that reservation so they could buy things to help them with their farming and agriculture. Um, Already from the get-go, the settlers that had already been there at, in the Mankato area were upset because they had to leave their property in order for this um, reservation to be set up. So they were already upset. Uh, before President Lincoln even signed the agreement to sell that half, um, settlers were already rushing in there to, to claim land. 
Um, and then we had the Dakota Uprising of 1862. Um, that was between the Dakota and the settlers. Um, it was basically a disagreement dispute over how the Indian agent was treating the Dakota at that time. And so this little uprising, I'm not, I can't even remember how long it lasted, but anyway, um, because of this, they said, we don't want any more of these Indians in Minnesota. Um, so everybody got moved and we went over to Crow Creek, which is actually where Standing Rock um, is located. Uh, for those of you who remember the pipeline issue, uh, the big encampment in 2016. We got to Crow Creek and you can't even drink the water. Uh, you can't plant anything. Um, when you're on a reservation, uh, you got to stay on that reservation. You're not really allowed to leave to go hunt. Um, so we were pretty miserable there. And through all of these changes, um, people would die in large numbers from illnesses. Sometimes our um, elderly would not be able to make the trek and they would die. Um, and they weren't even given a, a burial. Um, the soldiers were um, just so insistent on everyone to keep moving that there were some elders or anyone who passed away along the way would just be left there. Um, so we lost, lost a considerable number of people um, during all of these removals. So we get to South Dakota, um, North Dakota, South Dakota. Um, and it was so miserable that we had some of our leaders, they went down to Nebraska where the Omaha tribe is and said, would you have some land that we can come and live on? Um, they agreed. So of the annuity payments that are promised in the treaties to us, the United States took that money, purchased that land from the Omaha and established the reservation in Nebraska. And we still today have um, that reservation and that is the Nebraska Winnebago who are on that reservation. Well, through all of this time, there were plenty of Ho-Chunk who did not want to move. This is our home. Our ancestors are here. Um, our sacred sites are here. So a lot of people would sneak back home. Um, and sometimes they were able to hide out and never even you know, be removed at all. I've heard that sometimes that people would be removed, they'd head back, and uh, by the time the soldiers got back, they're already there. Um, so, and I'm very grateful for them, because now, um, after the, after the Dawes Act, um, that was 1883, I think, um, nope, 1887, um, that was when they said, we will give you acreage. You will own this property. Um, that kind of, at, that along with other issues that were going on, including the Civil War, kind of slowed down the forced removals um, outside of Wisconsin. And with the Dawes Act, that was the first time we were given this idea or, or forced this idea upon us of owning attractive land. It was always a collective kind of thing. So it was foreign to us. Um, this is also when we started to see the whole idea of blood quantum, which is defines whether you can be tribally enrolled or not and be in a federally recognized tribe. Um, if you were deemed uneducated, uncivilized, incompetent, uh, you're a full blood Indian. Uh, if you seem to be more educated or you were mixed, then you were not, and they would give you US citizenship and you would not get some of these allotments. Um, so that's where we saw blood quantum begin, which is a um, very contentious issue amongst a lot of people. And then what we saw is they, they had it for 15 years, something like that. I can't remember all the details. There's so much to know. Um, well, then all of a sudden it would be, oh, I have a correction. You did get land if you were considered white, but it would be fee simple. We had tax-free for so many years, if you were considered full blood, um, and then it would be taxable. Well, a lot of land was sold because they didn't even know about this whole tax thing. Uh, and all of a sudden they owe this money and they don't have it, so they would sell it. So we lost even more land because of the Dawes Act. Um, 
but we did see that a lot of people okay. were able to maintain some of their area. Um, the area down okay. in <laughs> down in um, Baraboo, um, where our Ho Chun Casino is down there. Um, are we able to to mute? Um, I'm looking to see who's unmuted. Oh, it's um, Emily Martell. If you could mute your microphone. Thank you. Um, yeah, down there, there was um, Chief uh, Yellow Thunder and some of the allotment that he had, uh, he gifted back to the people. And so then the village started there and that happened in other places as well. And so now we have, we don't have a reservation. Those of us that did not make it to Nebraska, um, stayed here. We became citizens in 1924, but we did not have a federally recognized tribe until 1963. Uh, the 1934 Reorganization Act allowed tribes to create their own constitution and then they could be federally recognized. Well, we did not do that until 1963. And then we were known as the Wisconsin Winnebago's. In 1994, we adopted a new constitution and with that constitution, we took back our own name of Ho-Chunk. So now we're known as the Ho-Chunk Nation. Um, and we don't have a reservation ourselves. Uh, we are one of two recognized tribes in the United States that do not, but we have lots of trust properties that is in the name of the Ho-Chunk Nation throughout Wisconsin, um, Illinois, Minnesota, and Iowa. Um, no, not Iowa, not Iowa, sorry. Um, <laughs> that um, it's called a checkerboard reservation. So it's us and a tribe in the Pacific Northwest that are considered checkerboard, uh, which is in some ways beneficial, in some ways not, um, but that's how we are now today. So we get back to the 1800s. You know, as, as I had said, you know, if you were uncivilized, you were considered full-blood Indian. Um, all of these treaties of land sessions would promise monetary annuities for so many years, um, provisions such as food, um, uh, blah, blah. animals, <laughs> I can't think of the word I wanna say, um, tobacco, um, all kinds of stuff that were promised. Um, that was pretty darn expensive for the United States to keep up on that. Pretty darn expensive. So how do you do that? You try and figure out how not to pay. Well, the fewer native people there are, the less expensive it gets, right? So since they didn't get rid of us through the removals, they didn't get rid of us on the reservations, how can we get rid of them? Because we cannot sustain this. Assimilate. So with assimilation came the darkest era um, for all native people. And that's when we started to see the boarding schools. Um, General Pratt, Richard Pratt, um, he had been in the military and he was in charge of some Native Americans who were prisoners. And what he did is that he gathered them together, put them into military uniforms and had a very strict regimen for the day. Um, teach, and he taught them how to read, speaking English, gave them English names, and he felt that it was a very good experiment. And so why not do this with children? Um, he is the one who, who um, said, save the Indian, not the man. No, save the man, not the Indian, sorry. <laughs> um, and he started the first major off-reservation boarding school um, known as Carlisle in Pennsylvania. So what would happen with these, we had day schools on the reservations, just like, you know, public school, you know, you go for the day, you go home. But with these off-reservation schools, a lot of the children would be sent to a school far from home. Um, they started off with children the age six to 15, then they changed it from, or no, six to 16, and then they changed the average age of five to 15. In Canada, they took even smaller children. And you can, like you asked like, well, why would people even send their children? 
a lot of parents would be threatened with withholding um, the annuities and the commodities that were promised um, or even threatened with jail if they did not send their children. Some parents would send their children because they were so impoverished they couldn't feed their children and they thought this is a way for my child to eat. Um, so you would have usually a government agent come and take your children. Um, and all you know is that they're going off to this school. They're going to get educated. They're going to be fed. They're going to be housed. Um, what you didn't know is what's going to happen to them when they got there. Um, the children would get there. And I want you to remember, these are like small children, five, six, seven years old. Um, you arrive at this school, you cannot understand anything they're saying because you've only been raised with your own language. You don't know English. You've rarely ever heard it, if ever. Um, you get there and there are these adults speaking to you in this different language. You can't understand what they're telling you to do. They take you to a room. They have you disrobe. And then they will give you a bath. And sometimes they would use those hard coarse brushes to scrub you down. They would put chemicals in your hair to kill the bugs that they were just convinced would be there because the children were all dirty children. Um, their hair would be cut, which can be very traumatic because if, for many tribes, if your hair, when you cut your hair, it's because someone has passed away. So then you've got these children wondering who died. Um, they give you new clothes. Um, and if you can think of the clothes in the late 1800s, they looked extremely uncomfortable to me, pinching boots, very stiff um, collars. They would oftentimes be military type uniforms for these children. Um, so many of these schools were contracted with churches. And so there would be a lot of nuns and priests that were running these schools. Um, so they had to make sure that they were Christianized. That was a big thing about being a civilized person in the United States. You were a good Christian person. Um, so that was a major aspect of the boarding schools. Um, they would often be forced to pick or given English names, often biblical names. Um, and their day would consist of very strict schedule for the day. Um, morning chores, breakfast, um, a little time to learn English, learn some math. And then the afternoons were when they would be teaching um, housekeeping, sewing, cooking to the girls and the boys would maybe be outside learning carpentry, doing some farming. And basically the schools would rely on all of the child labor to take care of what was needed around the school. A lot of kids did get sick because now you're in this huge building. Uh, most of the kids were separated into a boy's room and a girl's room. So you could have dozens and dozens of children sleeping in the same room. So one gets sick, many more do. Um, the food served to the children was often not very good. Uh, in fact, in Canada, part of the reason we have those nutrition facts on food um, is a result of some research and experiments that happened up in Canada. And some of it was on the children in the boarding schools who were purposely, some of them were purposely malnourished so that they could test to see what other vitamins or minerals would make them better. And most of them didn't work. So they would die or continue to be malnourished and get sickly. Um, the like I said, the food was usually not very good for the students, but the adults usually ate pretty well. One of the worst parts uh, for these children was that um, most places, if you spoke your own language, you would be physically punished. You were not allowed to like hang out and be affectionate with your siblings that might be there. They were separated from each other to try and keep that disconnect with home. There was a lot of sexual abuse. Um, some of the stories that I've heard are pretty atrocious um, and it was very common, unfortunately. Um, children would be at these schools. Sometimes they would try and run away. Um, 
But like I said, they would put them in a school that was pretty far from home, so it would make it more difficult. They thought it would just completely dissuade them from trying to run home. Um, but kids still tried to do it. Sometimes they'd get home and an Indian agent would show back up and take them right back. Uh, sometimes they didn't make it home. Um, there are a lot of children died trying to get home. Um, and whenever it was that these um, children would be done with school, um, then even more problems would start. Uh, you would try and go home and you rarely ever actually did get to visit with your parents. And if you did, it was because they had to come up with the money to either get you to come home or for them to come and visit. Um, they would get home and they, it, when you're physically punished so much for something, uh, your brain just won't do it. Um, a, lot of peop, a lot of kids forgot their own language. Um, I know my father um, suffered like that. Um, he started school, did not know English, um, and it was drilled into him. Luckily, he wasn't getting physical punishment. I don't think he never said anything because um, he was at a public school in Minnesota. But um, his parents just stopped speaking Ho Chunk at home. So the only time I heard he heard it was with he was with his grandparents. Um, and when my son was born, I was like, he's going to speak Ho Chunk. Because I'd grown up with lots of words, just not conversational stuff. Um, and so then my son, um, he started school. We were teaching him Ho-Chunk. He was going to classes. And um, he would say something. And it would take my dad quite a while to understand what my son said. Because he had forgotten these words. Because he hadn't used them for so long. But yeah, you get home um, from the schools. And you cannot necessarily communicate with your family. Um, and some of them, it, they really were brainwashed with this Christian ideal that sometimes they disliked their own family because they were taught these are uncivilized heathens who I should not be associated with. So sometimes they never even went home or if they did, they just didn't want to be there anymore or their family was not as friendly to them. Um, but you, even though you've got to learn all of these possible trades while you're at school, um, you go into a town, you're still not gonna get hired for a job because you're a Native American, you're Indian. You're still not gonna get hired. So that kind of leaves them just lost in the middle. Um, drinking had already been a problem, but it also became much more of a problem for people who were um, no longer in the schools. And then you get to a point where they may find someone and they have children. And when you think about, for those of you that are parents, how did you figure out how to raise your children, how to take care of them? Most likely, uh, it was what you learned from your own parents, what to do, what you don't want to do, because maybe you didn't feel that was the right thing to do. Well, these are now new parents who grew up with nuns and priests who often physically abused you, sexually abused you, showed absolutely no affection to you. That's when we start to see social services coming in and removing these small children from their parents and often be adopted out into a white family, white Christian family. Um, if your child wasn't removed from you, um, you would probably end up sending your child to that same boarding school. Um, there are generations of a family who went to boarding schools um, and coming out with these same emotional, physical problems um, that their parents and grandparents did. Um, the boarding schools in America um, kind of started to fizzle out in the 1930s, um, where a lot of the churches stopped being associated, a lot of them closed. Um, in the, um, later on, um, they would 
change their curriculum. They actually were focused more on being positive schools for Native American youth. In Canada, the last one closed in 1997. Um, so this is not something from the distant past that we're dealing with. Um, Like I said, um, the in, in America, the United States, um, they did change. Um, and the United States still does provide the funding um, for ed Indian education. Why? Because they promised that in the treaties. In the end, this assimilation is probably costing them more money um, because our populations are increasing. And now we have other things going on. Um, like I had mentioned before, social workers were coming in and removing children from the home. There are advertisements. There's one that's been found and in, 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 in kind of floated around on the internet. Um, Indian baby for $10. Um, they didn't have to have a reason to remove the child from the home being poor, not being Christian, or reasons to remove these children from the home. So a lot of babies that were taken from their parents and adopted out. Uh, another attempt to try and assimilate was the relocation programs in the 40s and 50s. And this was an idea of the United States where they would say, hey, we will pay for you and your family. We'll move you to one of these larger cities will help you get an apartment, will help you get a job, and you will be able to provide for your families rather than be on these reservations where there's no job and you have to scrounge for food. A lot of people took advantage of that. Uh, you see large communities of native people in Los Angeles, Denver, Chicago, Minneapolis, um, New York, um, of these people who relocated um, under the United States program. A lot of people also went home if they could. They would get there and maybe that was very substandard, it usually was substandard housing. Um, maybe they couldn't get a job, they couldn't keep a job. Um, they were miserable. Well, the United States said they'd pay for you to get there. They weren't gonna pay for you to go home. So we ended up with a lot of people in poverty in these large cities and there are still very large communities in those bigger cities. Um, so that was another way of trying to get rid of the cost associated with the United States Native Americans. Um, so what happens when you've moved people, put them on reservations, stolen their children, either with the school or out to adoption, and tried to relocate people to large cities where they're disconnected from their people again? Intergenerational trauma. Um, when you look at eugenics, they have found that there is a physiological change for people who have, are, are intergenerational trauma survivors. Um, so intergenerational trauma is, is different than PTSD. PTSD is a personal traumatic event. Um, for interge intergenerational trauma, this is something where a massive, um, traumatic event happens to a population of people. Um, so when we're looking at the Indian wars and the removals and the boarding schools, um, it happened to us just like with um, the Holocaust prisoners during World War II. Their descendants also have intergenerational trauma because the coping systems or coping mechanisms that your body uses changes how your body's working. And then that is passed on to your children. And what they have found is that the trauma turns certain parts of your DNA on and off. Um, they can attribute depression to this. Um, I have a theory that our, our diabetes problem is partially due to this. Um, we also have uh, in our genetics, when it comes to drinking alcohol, our bodies don't know when to stop. So that exacerbates the alcohol problem. 
And, and I can attest as an alcoholic, I did not know when to stop. Um, so we're dealing with intergenerational trauma with our kids today. We have a lot of resilience. Obviously we've stuck around this long. We've still gotten through things, but we're not doing it necessarily in a good way. A lot of substance abuse, a lot of nutritional problems, unemployment. These are all issues that we're dealing with. And a lot of it can easily be traced back to all of these traumatic events that happened to our people in the past. So one of our newest traumatic events, which is actually just resurfacing, if you, you could say it, that's a bad way to say it. I shouldn't have said it that way. Anyway, um, it has started in Canada where at Kamloops School, they found 215 children buried at the school. In Canada, of the schools that have been checked now, it is over 7,000 children in unmarked graves or even marked graves because there are schools with cemeteries. Carlisle has a cemetery for the children. A lot of parents didn't even know what happened to their children. They just never came home. They were never told that their child died. They might find out from one of the other kids that came home that they died. And our practices for sending the bodies of our, of, of our family um, they're very important to us that if we don't do it in that way, we don't believe that that person's spirit will find their way home. And so you have these parents who find out their children have died and they were just buried in the ground with no ceremony, not wearing, you know, their, their own traditional clothes. So um, it has been a very horrifying year as these children were found. Um, Deb Halland, the now Department of Interior Secretary, um, also one of the first Native American women that was elected into Congress, um, she is planning to do the same thing for the United States. And actually, as soon as I leave here, I'm going to the Native American Boarding School Summit where she is actually, we're gonna be talking with her tomorrow. Um, but, they estimate it's closer to about 40,000 children in the United States that were attending the boarding schools. We had several boarding schools in Wisconsin. Uh, the closest one to us would be in Toma. Toma Industrial School was the largest in Wisconsin. Um, its target population were Ho-Chunk, but as I've gone through um, the list of children who were there that I could get a hold of, um, a lot of them were also from other tribes. Uh, that school now um, houses, well, some of the building is a little bit is left, but where the Veterans Administration Hospital is in Toma. Um, there are unmarked graves at the Toma VA Hospital. Um, there is a plaque actually um, that has been erected um, on the grounds acknowledging that. And just this past fall, um, we held um, a memorial, you could say, um, to those children. And I've never experienced, but I've heard lots of other people experiencing some of these spirits of these children um, on those grounds and in those buildings. Um, but we were there to pay our respects and to um, just remember these children who didn't get to go home. Um, I do believe in about 10 days, you have another speaker who is talk, also talking about this and um, other issues that are going on. So let's get on to a little happier topic. Um, the 70s saw the civil rights era of the Native Americans. We had In the 60s, we had a lot of civil rights um, for African-Americans, but in the 70s, it was our time. Um, we had a lots of um, education laws uh, and that is when the Bureau of Indian Education uh, really started kicking in to change the boarding schools. That, there were still boarding schools. There still are boarding schools. We do have boarding schools still, um, but they are focused on supporting um, the culture, supporting the youth, uh, encouraging um, language um, protection 
um, and preservation. They're actually good schools and a lot of people do send their children off to these schools now. Um, we also had the Indian Child Welfare Act in 1978. That states where if a child is eligible to be enrolled in a tribe, um, is taken from the parents, the placement of that child is preferably another family member, if not another tribal member, if not a tribal member from a different tribe, if not then finally to anyone who is interested in being a foster parent. Um, that has been challenged in this, the Supreme Court um, and it kind of fell apart this year. But in Wisconsin, um, thanks to my nephew's grandmother, she was one of the major, um, <coughs> major defenders of the Indian Child Welfare Act. And now Wisconsin actually has its own Wisconsin Indian Child Welfare Act because it was not being adhered to. Um, so those same standards still hold in Wisconsin because we had our own law here in the state. Um, I have heard of still children being adopted out to other families, um, but Having worked with La Crosse County, I can say that their social workers are now finally um, much better prepared to work within the Indian child welfare um, field. Um, when I was a foster parent, they were not, they were not aware of the law. Um, so I had to do some fighting to get the kids that I needed to have in my home. Um, 1978 also saw the Freedom of Religion Act. Now for everybody else in the United States, it was in the Constitution. We didn't get the freedom of religion until 1978. I was already five years old at that time. Um, if not for my ancestors over the last 130 years, um, hiding and practicing our ceremonies, uh, I would not have those to rely on for my own well-being. Um, but it was finally then that you could practice it and not be punished in some way. I don't know. I don't even know if it was in jail or if you got some kind of fine. I don't know. Um, yeah, we did. We got that in 1978. Cool, huh? <laughs> um, 1988, we got the Indian Gaming Relation Regulation Act that allowed tribes who live in states where there's already state lottery to start having bingo. And then a little bit later, um, what we call um, class three gaming. That has been major help for a handful of tribes. There are over 570 tribes. A handful of us actually do well because of gaming. I am very fortunate to be one of those, be belong to one of those tribes. Um, without that gaming profit, um, I would not have been able to go to college. My parents would not have been able to have their own home. Um, it pays for all of our programming. We have grants, federal grants and gaming money that pay for everything. And we help people with looking for jobs. We help them with housing, um, youth pro, well, I work for the youth services program. Um, there's so many things. We have health clinics. You know, there's so many things now that we're able to do because of gaming. And most of our tribal members do not qualify to be on state support anymore because of tribal gaming. Um, the pandemic has screwed that up a bit, but um, we were actually doing pretty well. Um, we also make sure that we give to the um, areas that we are in. Um, we have communities all over. Out of my program, Youth Services, we have 10 youth centers um, in Wisconsin and Minnesota. Um, you know, and, and we give back to all of those um, areas um, in different ways. We have contracts, agreements with fire department, police department, um, not only to help give back, but also to make sure they actually answer the emergency calls because they didn't before. <laughs> Um, so we've got all this going on. I, I give you sad stories. Um, our current social problems, what's going on now? You know, like I said, we have, we have an opiate, opiate epidemic. Um, 
We still see a lot of child removals, but that is because the parents are maybe addicted and there is neglect or abuse going on at home. Um, we have education gaps everywhere. Um, we still, many of us still live in this poverty mentality where if you've got extra money, you spend it. We don't have this idea of saving up money. Um, even home ownership is fairly new to us. Um, only, the la only in the 1900s do we actually see home ownership. Um, we still see our families dealing a lot with physical abuse and sexual abuse. Um, I wish I could say as last generation of my family to suffer and I found out I'm not. And that makes me extremely sad. Um, it made so that my son, I would not let him go and stay at a friend or family's house in certain communities because I could not be there to make sure someone did not hurt him. And so I had to restrict his social life as a child because of it. Um, our missing and murdered indigenous women or people. <laughs> The numbers of our people who go missing or are murdered is astronomical. They are a, a huge number uh, um, involved in human trafficking. Um, very rarely get put on, out into the public um, for Amber Alerts or anything like that. Um, various reasons, um, but it's very sad. Um, my Facebook feed usually every day has a series of notifications from the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women Network of missing people. Um, that's another major issue going on. Um, the land back, land back is big. Um, and that kind of goes along with our environmental justice. Um, we have the line three going up, um, Northern Minnesota, Wisconsin area um, with uh, Winona LaDuke from the White Earth Reservation, she's um, very prominent in um, environmental justice and food sovereignty. And she's actually going to be a part of the White Privilege Symposium happening here in La Crosse, December 2nd and 3rd, I think are the dates. 3rd and 4th, I don't know. Look, waking up yeah. white, just search that and you'll find it. <laughs> the 3rd, the th Friday the 3rd and then uh, Saturday the 4th, we will also be attending. And oh, okay, awesome. I'm talking on the 4th too. Um, <laughs> um, but that that's, you know, I don't remember why I was talking about it. But anyway, um, you know, we have a lack of visibility. We're called the invisible population. People don't know about us. I've gone to talk to children and didn't even know we still existed. So, um, so what can people do? Educate yourselves. Find out whose land you live on. We're doing a lot of land acknowledgements now. Find out whose land you live on. In Viroqua, uh, the Sauk and the Ho-Chunk were the primary inhabitants of that area. Um, make sure when you're in some type of um, committee or whatever, make sure that you see who's at the table. And not just, you know, for, for my own community, but if it's all white, then who's speaking up for the people of color in your communities? Make sure everybody's at the table that it's gonna affect. Um, I did grab some of the books I have here at the house, not all of them, because I have a lot, I have four bookshelves at work. Um, um, when you're looking specifically at Ho-Chunk, ooh, hopefully this shows up, Ugh. people of the big voice, um, it's basically a, a pictorial um, publication, but there is some also um, information on there, historical information. Um, another one, oh, this is, this sucks. Um, <laughs> this is Patty Lowe's Native People of Wisconsin. There's a children's edition and um, the adult edition. Um, these are excellent books. Patty Lowe is Bad River and Ho-Chunk, thanks babe. Um, um, Nancy Astrick-Lurie, 
Uh, we actually call her Nancy Guff. She was adapted into the nation. Um, she passed away a couple years ago, but she was an anthropologist. Great, great person. Um, Louise Erdrich is another author. Um, she has birch bark books up in the Minneapolis area. She has lots of publications. Um, there's lots of children's books. I happen to have <laughs> I happen to have Thunder Boy Jr. by Sherman Alexi. Joseph Bruchak is amazing. Uh, he's my favorite native author. He does children's books. He does adult books. He does young adult books. Um, he's great. So checking out these books, there's tons of movies. Just Google uh, Native American boarding schools, whatever it is you're interested in looking at. Um, I will tell you that the boarding school ones, hard to watch. Um, if you have young children in the house, it's probably not a good idea to watch it while they're going to be able to view it. Um, a lot of a lot of movies have come out in the last few years when it comes to boarding schools, and I went way longer than I thought it was going to. So I'm going to let you ask some questions now if you have any. Yes, we'll definitely open that up. I did want to mention that um, at Brookwood's Library here, Macintosh Memorial, um, we do have a whole bunch of books out on display that are um, by um, different. Um, I'm sorry. I want to make sure I'm addressing it correctly. I do go by Native American or Native Indian. Can you speak to that for yourself today, perhaps? <laughs> um, you're safe with Native American. Okay. Um, some people go with Indigenous, First Nations, which is what Canada uses primarily. Um, some people don't care. Some people are fine with Indian, American Indian. I used to care. I am getting to the point where I don't really care because I'm Ho-Chunk. Right. Yes. Those other words are English. I'm Ho-Chunk. Um, so I'd prefer okay. that if people know that. Yes. So we do have a few um, Ho-Chunk uh, voices or authors um, and then other tribes as well. Um, but also in all of our sections, which is youth, teen or young adult and um, adult. So we do have book lists as well on our web, web, web site, excuse me. So yeah, please um, let's open up some questions. You are more than welcome to um, unmute if you wanted to or give a little wave, otherwise our chat, um, I can also read them off as well, which I do see we have at least one. Um, and it states, do you come into schools and speak to children about your history or tribe? I do, I do, I do, I do. So um, uh, let me put my email address here. Um, if I can type, <laughs> um, just email me and we can figure out what you're looking for and when we can do it. All right. We have is, oh, I'm getting a whole bunch. Can you read them at all? Um, um, otherwise, I can read them out loud. I see, is the sessions of the Ho-Chunk Homelands map available online somewhere? Is it available for use? Um, yeah, look up Ho-Chunk removals map and there's a couple of them. Um, and as far as I know, they are common usage. Um, next is, do you think that it is appropriate for folks and businesses to acknowledge all First Nations groups that have passed through the land or just who were there first, who has been allowed to return? I would say everybody. Um, this area has seen multiple. It's just that it, as far as, well, we didn't have permanent, but we consistently had the villages in the La Crosse area, La Crosse and Alaska. That's who's that's whose remains have been found um, when there's been construction projects. Um, but I know at UW La Crosse, you're also, we, they, their land acknowledgement also acknowledges all tribes. Um, yeah. So I can uh, uh, speak to this last one. Will this recording be available? It will. We're going to have it in two spots. Right now, we are also on Facebook Live. So if you go to our Facebook page and go under videos, um, even though it is happening right now, it is then available for viewing afterwards. Um, and we will also be in the works of putting it on our YouTube channel, though that does take a little bit of time because we have to go get it edited. Um, and then we work with um, Vernon uh, Communications 
And so they will play it on a local channel as well once it is edited. All right, what is the relationship of Ho-Chunk to Kickapoo Reserve? Uh, we, had we have sacred sites there. Um, we have acreage that is put into trust for the nation. Uh, we also have seats on the Kickapoo Valley Reserve Management Board. I still technically have one, but I haven't been able to attend meetings in my actual, my term was up years ago, but no one's taken my spot. Um, but yeah, we, we also, we always have our tribal historical preservation officer on there. Um, we usually have someone from our department of natural resources within the nation. Um, and then usually a couple other seats that are filled by Ho-Chunks. Um, but yeah, there are some sacred sites there. Um, we also have a question. Do you have any suggestions for a land acknowledgement that goes beyond being just performative? I'm actually, my, my supervisor and I are actually working with the Onalaska School District right now, um, just at the beginning. Um, and what their plans are is they're, we've come up with a land acknowledgement. They're going to have it put onto a plaque. They're going to be placing it outside. But along with it, there's going to be QR codes and there'll be um, sometimes there'll be, be some permanent links on there, but then we'll also possibly change links. And then once we've got that established, uh, I'll be working with them on the curriculum. And they also happen to have an amazing librarian there um, in Alaska School District. Um, I can't tell you how proud I am of her for how much she has improved their uh, elementary libraries to include a very diverse library um, when it comes to the children's books. Uh, it's amazing. That is, that is definitely wonderful, wonderful to hear. Um, so it, it looks like we have another more of a comment just uh, saying thank you so much for this talk and information, especially pointing us to resources for further reading and learning, um, which is to me, very important, but I am a librarian, so um, <laughs> anything about books and new information, right? Um, I also yeah. just want to express just how truly grateful I am that you have come and spoken with us and been just really true. Um, I can admit, like, it is hearing you speak has, has moved me a lot. Um, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little teary eyed. It was just very, very true. And yeah, just thank you so much for expressing and sharing everything that you did today. It was, it was a privilege and an honor to have you um, open up about that. So thank you. I want to make sure everybody gets their questions in. Yeah, um, is that supposed to be mower or lower? I don't know of Mower County. But uh, my family is from Houston County. Houston, okay. If that answers. <laughs> and I will let you, Maggie, take on about the discussion on the 29th. Yes, I see that. Um, yes, there is another conversation um, on the 29th, which is a Monday. Um, and that will be, I believe it's at one o'clock. I can double check that. Um, uh, and it is with a woman named Elizabeth um, Digby Britton, I think is how you say it. Um, and as we, I need to just double check with that presenter to make sure they are okay with being recorded and having it recorded. It will be in person for anybody who would like to um, come and we highly encourage, but I will do my best to either perhaps do a Facebook Live again or um, a Zoom as well. So yes, it will be recorded if she is able and willing. So it looks oh. like in response to the Mower County, it's just east of Houston and Fillmore County. I think Houston County is the river. So. <laughs> I get, maybe I'm confused by the way it's being stated, but, um, oh no, I can tell you. We, at one point, yes, uh, Crawford County, yeah, you would have seen Sauk 
or, or what's now Sac and Fox because they had to join together and Ho-Chunk definitely were intermingled there. And actually here in La Crosse where the Riverside Park is, that used to all be beach all the way up to like their 7th Street. Um, mm -hmm. Look, the game of lacrosse would be played there. And in our stories, the Giants played from Prairie du Chien all the way up to Red Wing along that area. And those were often played to um, settle disputes. Um, but yeah, it was this whole area, um, a lot of travel with other tribes as well. So if people wanted to, I know there's been a little bit of talk about um, you know, just recognizing and, you know, doing the land acknowledgement, where would perhaps people go to find out if or who or how, all of that? Um, my suggestion would be, um, first of all, make sure you know um, the first peoples of where you're at. Um, just go online and Google. I do this myself all the time. Um, Google land acknowledgements and you will get a list of the various ones that you see at the universities. Um, a lot of organizations have them posted on their websites. I know the La Crosse Public Library um, has one. Um, some of the, some of the um, stores, our schools, the public schools have these acknowledgements. So that's a good place to start to figure out how you want it worded, but please make it more than just something that's said, make sure that there's something behind it, whether it's educating people, making sure people are included, whatever it may be, don't make it just something that's said. Right. Well, thank you everyone um, for joining us. And thank you again, Tracy. I will end the recording um, and then I will end the Zoom here for people. Just, I am sure Tracy has a very busy rest of her day as well. And we have taken at least an hour of her time. So um, thank you for oh, taking actually, that an time. hour and a half. I apologize for going so long, but thank you everybody <laughs> for your attention and being here. I really, I, as painful as it can be, I love doing this because I just think it's so important for people to learn. So thank you. Well, very you are much. getting lots of thanks here in the chat. I see that. From many if not all people here <laughs> and i love all you that i don't ever get to see much anymore or those like lynette who i do get to see <laughs> <laughs> yes all right well thank you everyone and have a great weekend and thanks again tracy and yes just thank you all right bye everyone